you have central heat and air, you have a device in your, somewhere in your house that may be the uh, source of great controversy in your house. It's a little box on the wall that regulates the climate in your house. It helps to produce or to maintain a comfortable environment. The question comes as to the definition of comfort and who is defining comfort. There may be disagreement in your house as to what comfort is. And so sometimes that little device can be the source of great discomfort instead of comfort. That device has on it two components. One of those components is a thermometer that is able to sense the environment around it. It measures the temperature and displays the temperature on the screen and says this is how it feels in the house. Now you can have your opinion as to whether that feeling is good or bad, but that feeling is what that feeling is. It is left open to in personal interpretation as to whether or not that's the right feeling. But also in that little box, not only is there a thermometer that measures the environment around it, there is a device called a thermostat. And because of that thermostat, you are able to slide a little slider or turn a little knob, and you are able to then change the environment that is around you. If you're too cold, then you ask the thermostat to please make it warmer. If you are too hot, you ask the thermostat to please make it a little cooler. And you don't dare tell your wife that you did that. Both of those work together to give us comfort in our home, to regulate what's going on around us. Whether or not you know it, maybe not in such a mechanical sense, but you and I have also our own little internal device that is both thermometer and thermostat as well. That's not a little box, but it can cause just as much confusion in our own life, in our own understanding, in our own thought as that little mechanical box on the wall can in a home. On the one side, we have a thermometer that measures the environment around us, measures how it feels. And I'm not talking about how it feels physically, how it feels emotionally, how it feels mentally. Those we call emotions. When things are going good, we are satisfied, or we are happy, or we are joyful, or we are, we are pleasant. But when our internal thermometer tells us that things aren't right around us, then it tells us that, or it, it, it leads us to be unhappy or unpleasant or discontented. But those feelings survey the environment around us in which we live, and they, they cause us then to, to be able to attach some sort of emotional value to what's going on in our life. And that's good. But we can't live simply by our thermometer. We're not stuck with what the thermometer says. Just because things are unpleasant in our life, we don't have to be unhappy. Just because things aren't going our way, we don't have to be disagreeable. And just because we are in physical pain, we don't have to be unpleasant. Uh, just because someone has said something to us that hurts our feelings doesn't mean that we have to be all down and depressed and feel so bad all the time. Our thermometer simply lets us know that happened, we're recording that, and now we need something to help us adjust accordingly to change the situation, to change how we feel about the environment around us. And that's where we have our own built-in 
thermostat. You see, our emotions measure what's going on in our life. Our thermometer is what we know. Because what we feel and what we know are not necessarily the same thing. Sometimes we feel as though reality is a certain thing, but when in fact that reality is not what we assume reality is, is not so. What in the world does that have to do with the 23rd Psalm? David struggled with his thermometer and his thermostat. You read through the book of Psalms, the ones he wrote and the ones that others wrote, and you see thermometer readings. You see times they were joyous, the writers were joyous, times they were depressed, times they were frustrated, times they were afraid. You see times they burst into to tremendous praise when they were extremely happy and, and full of joy. And in those psalms, you also see a thermostat at work where what they know about God begins to shape how they view the reality around them. Psalm 23 is such a case. Let's don't lose the context. Remember, David is running from his son Absalom who is trying to take over the kingdom. David's life has spiraled downward now for several years. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had her husband murdered, and then his children went all haywire, went all cray-cray on him, and one brother uh, killed another brother because that brother raped his sister, and it just got to be a big mess in the house of David. And now... The seed was coming to fruit. And the bad son was trying to push dad, the, son, the king of promise, the one after God's heart, not just push him off the throne trying to kill him. We believe that he wrote Psalm 23 in a cave, contemplating what was going on, or either shortly after his conquest and his victory and his return to Jerusalem, reflecting on his battle. See, you and I face battles like that every day. We feel certain ways about what goes on around us. We feel lonely. We feel angry. We get upset. Things don't go our way. Something doesn't turn out the way we thought it would. We get bad news about a health issue or something else. Or we just get tired. We just don't want to do things anymore. Uh, whatever the case may be, things just kind of go cray-cray in our own little world. David did not have a monopoly on cray-cray. So what do we do in that situation? As David closes out this psalm, he pushes the thermometer. I mean, he pushes the thermostat. He adjusts the thermostat on all that has happened, and he reflects on three promises from God that he knows. Not what he felt, but what he knew. And the main point I want us to get this morning as we make our way through this is that through the ups and downs of life, we can trust the promises of a faithful God. All of us are going to have a thermometer that goes up and down. There are going to be days things go our way and we're on top of the world. And then we're going to get waylaid. It's like that insurance commercial. Life comes at us fast. And chaos can happen. What we feel will lie to us. What we feel will try to tell us that reality is different from what reality really is. But what we know about God what he has promised in his word, what he has said about himself and his work that he is doing in our life. And because of the work of Christ on the cross for us, when, when we, we own what we feel, but when we turn to what we know, there are some things about God we can know. And three of those he gives for us. And we're going to kind of quickly work our way through it. Three promises from a faithful God. First of all, this morning, David wants to remind us that we are promised God's goodness when things are bad. He begins verse 6 that way. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
goodness. And you see, I've put there on the screen something I believe is very important. God is not good because he does good things. In other words, we don't, we don't get to declare God good because we observe the good he does. God is not a scientific experiment uh, that we observe and we look at, and because we have seen these good things, then we can say he's good. No, God is already good. And because he is good, he does good things. He's not good because he does good things, but because he's good, then he does these good things. It's a subtle difference in the way we approach that. And let me explain why I believe this is important. Please hear me out on this. this I want to be as sensitive to this as I can, but I, I think for those of us that are Christians, trying to be sensitive to the, to, to the people around us and that we touch is an important issue. We are very quick when we hear an answer to prayer or when something good happens or when there's something praiseworthy to say, God is good. And there's nothing wrong with that because indeed those are evidences of God's goodness. But I think we need to be careful about how we say God is good when we are responding to those good things because what does that say to the person who didn't get good news? We get our health report back and we hear that all things are clear and we say God is good. What does it say to the person who received the diagnosis they have terminal cancer? Well, I don't think God's good. God must be good to you, but he's not good to me. And we know that's not true. If we're not careful, we begin to only celebrate the goodness of God in the good, what we would call the good moments. The problem with that is that we fail to understand the what and the when of good. We define good by our terms and not God's terms. We, 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 we are quick to declare good on our schedule and not on God's schedule. We, we, we tend to respond to things before God has a chance to play the whole thing out. So we need to be careful that we understand that even when the news is not good, God is still good. This is why that's important, because there are going to be times in your life when the news isn't good. And when the news isn't good, you need to hang on to the truth that God is good just as much, if not more, in those times than you do in the good times. I mean, let's face it, when it worked out in our favor, we don't really need a lot of faith then, do we? It all worked out great, end of story, amen, let's move on. But when it's bad and we're living in it day in and day out and we are rehearsing that bad diagnosis, we are hurting or we are rehearsing that failed relationship or we are having to go day in and day out to the miserable job or we are having to lay out the finances on the table in front of us trying to figure out how it's going to work when we're constantly faced with the bad that's when we need the truth that's when our thermometer says God is not good but our thermostat says no no I know that God is good God is just as good in the dark as he is in the light one of the most important Bible verses for us to know that gives us a thermostat is Romans 8 28 there Paul said and we know there's that word not we feel like not we guess not we hope we know that for those who love God all things work together for good notice what Paul didn't say we know for those who love God all things turn out good or only good things happen. No, all things, even the bad ones, work together for good. Why? To those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? His purpose is to transform our life. His purpose is to make us more like Jesus. And it's in those dark times, it's in the times when the news wasn't good, that we trust that God is up to a good work. And that good work is that he is bit by bit conforming us to the image of Christ. If God was only good when things were good, there would have been a time when his own son would have thought he wasn't good. God does allow bad things to happen. Yes, he allowed the cross to happen. Now, the cross was a great thing for us. We call it Good Friday. Wasn't such a great Friday for Jesus. Rough time for him. 
Talk about having a bad day. But God was good even in that bad. So whatever you're going through today, whatever you are struggling with today, remember that even when things are bad, God is good. Your thermometer will tell you it's bad. Let your thermometer adjust your attitude and say, well, things may be bad, but God is good. And I'll, I'll choose to trust God even in bad. Romans 8, 28 is a very familiar verse to us. Romans 8, 32 may not be, but it's just as important. Romans 8, 32, Paul says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Now think about that. God gave up his son, Jesus, for us all. He went to that length. How will he not graciously give us all even in the bad, this good God overcomes the bad with his good. So I encourage you today that when things are bad and you feel bad, it's okay. Just understand the feeling is not the reality. The reality, your, your, thermo, your thermostat adjusts your attitude to the reality that God is good. Things may be bad, but God is good. The second promise that David reminds us of this morning is that we can be assured that God, we have God's mercy even when we fall into sin. Surely goodness and mercy. Now this word mercy translates a very important Old Testament Hebrew word, kesed. In fact, this word mercy is also translated loving kindness, steadfast love, it's translated mercy. It is, the Old it is to the Old Testament picture of God what grace is to the New Testament picture of God. In fact, if, if, if John Newton had been writing a song in the Old Testament days instead of in the New Testament days, instead of amazing grace, it would have been amazing mercy. Grace is getting something we didn't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we actually did deserve. Grace is gravy. Grace is, I've got all of this, and God's still giving me more. I didn't deserve it, I didn't earn it, but he's giving it to me anyway. Mercy is, whew, I didn't even deserve to eat. And God has given me food to eat. They're, they're, they're two sides to the same coin. They work hand in hand. It's a very important word for us to understand God's mercy. Because, see, here's the thing. When we sin, and, and certainly David must have been thinking about that because he thought all the way back, if, he, if David could have rewound his life to that spring day when he first saw Bathsheba, if he had a do-over, if his life had been a video game and he could have had a restart, he would have gone back and played it a lot differently. And for years, he lived with what were the consequences of that sin. Being, he's being chased. He's being threatened and about to be killed by one of the consequences of his sin. But even in, as the devil tried to remind him of that sin, Instead of remembering his sin, he remembered God's mercy. Too many times we get down on ourselves. We either get, it's funny how this works, we either get too down on ourselves because of our sin, or we get too high on ourselves and think that our sin isn't all that bad. You ever notice how we go to one of those two extremes? Well, you know, he's, preacher, you're preaching about somebody else now, I'm pretty good. Well, it depends on what measuring stick you're using as to whether or not you're pretty good. If you're measuring up to me, you're in good shape. You're doing great. But we all measure up to Jesus, and we're in trouble. All right? Thankfully, he took the measurement on the cross, the ultimate 
the ultimate display of mercy. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Paul says, 1 Corinthians, in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. I deserve to be on the cross. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I just want to get what I deserve. Oh, don't ever say that. I just, you know, I, I just want to get what I deserve. You got, if we got what we deserve, we wouldn't be having church today. I wouldn't be here at least. I'd be dead. And we've lost that sense of the, the marvelous mercy of God that even though we are still sinners, it's okay. God looks at us not with judgment. He took, Christ took all of the judgment on the cross. Christ bore all of God's wrath for our sin on the cross. Jesus took everything that God poured out for my sin and your sin, poured it all out on Jesus so that we could go free. And so those times when you're feeling pretty bad about yourself, well, I'll never amount to anything. I, I can't measure up. I won't be right. I won't do right. Remember that Jesus paid it all. And there's mercy when we fall into sin. One of the most prominent Old Testament passages that explains this mercy to us is Lamentations chapter 3 and verses 22 and 23 where Jeremiah writes, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. I like this line. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know what? God's mercy doesn't have a quota. God's mercy doesn't have an expiration date. God doesn't say, you know what? I've forgiven you too many times anymore. I, I just, you've used up your quota. You're going to have to wait a while. You're going to have to wait another three months and build up some mercy change before you can cash in on mercy. We start every day with a fresh bag of mercy. And it's a bag that never runs out. All the mercy you need, no matter what you have done, nor how much you have done, will ever completely and totally use up all the mercy God has for you. So when times are bad, we remember His goodness. But when we've been bad, remember His mercy. God is merciful and worthy to be praised. Don't let the thermometer tell you you're a failure, you're miserable, it'll never work, you won't be. Adjust the thermostat with the truth of God's mercy. And then finally, a third promise he wants us to remember is this, that we are promised God's presence both now and forever. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Literally, He's saying, and get the picture from David, I will return to the house. I will return to stay in the house of the Lord. He's been run out of Jerusalem. He's been run out of the capital. He never gets to go back uh, to, to, to where God once was. The temple had not been built. That was done under Solomon, but the tabernacle, the presence of God was set up in the middle of the camp. And it was in that tabernacle where they pictured the presence of God. The, the Ark of the Covenant was there, and that Ark of the Covenant represented to them the presence of God. That's why whenever they went out to battle, they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and it went out before them. That was to remind them that God was going to battle for them. That's why they were so particular about how they handled that Ark, who handled that Ark, when they handled that Ark. That's why, by the way, you want to read an interesting story in the Old Testament? This fellow named Uzzah, they were bringing the ark back to where it belonged. He didn't handle it right and dropped dead on the spot. They were pushing it basically in a wheelbarrow instead of carrying it like they were supposed to be carrying it. They were not dealing with the holiness of God like they should have been. 
And to make matters worse, when it started to tip over, he thought it was going to fall, he dared reach out and touch it, as if God could not protect his own presence. Needed his help. Died on the spot. That was the presence of God. So that's, David is remembering, back home is where God was. But, but there's a sense in which God was with him, but I'm going to go back, and I'm going to get to be in God's presence. Literally, the phrase is, for length of days. I'm not going to be out of God's presence again. Get this now. Here's the good part. In the New Testament times, since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down. Jesus said that when I go, I'm going to send another comforter, and he will be with you always. And on the day of Pentecost, God began to fill his believers with, with the presence of the Holy Spirit, God with us. So God no, longer, uh, no, God no longer limited his presence to a little box inside of a building. God now places his presence in the heart of you and me. Where once someone had to go somewhere, they had to go to get in God's presence. He has come to us and given us his presence always. In those times when your thermometer makes you feel lonely or that nobody sees or that nothing is going to work or that you're doomed or whatever the case may be, when that thermometer reads the bad around you, let what you know about the presence of God in your life adjust the thermostat. Yeah, this may be the situation right now, but God's here. God's here with me. One of my favorite verses is in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Everywhere I go through the Holy Spirit, Christ is there with me. I'm never completely alone. I'm never out of sight. I'm never out of mind. I'm never out of God's reach. I'm, he is always right there with me. I'm promised the presence of of God. That means no matter how bad the situation may be, I'm not there alone. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into a furnace, all of a sudden they looked down there and guess what? There weren't three, there were four because God was in the furnace with them. And whatever fire of trial, whatever fire of difficulty, whatever is raising the thermometer in your life right now, know that God is there with you and his presence is a calming presence. Just like Jesus coming to his disciples, walking on the water when their boat was in the middle of the storm. What did he say? It is I, be not afraid. He, didn't quite, he could have quieted the storm from the mountain where he was praying. He could have stood up there and just snapped his fingers and boom, the storm was gone. But what was more important than a quiet storm, a quiet uh, journey on the Sea of Galilee was having the presence of God even in the middle of the storm. You see, the storm wasn't the problem. That Jesus wasn't there was the problem. So you, your thermometer may be reading a storm in your life. And it may be accurately reading that. But hear Jesus say, it is I. Be not afraid. It wasn't long after declaring who he was and, that he, and announcing that he was there and getting in the boat with him that Jesus calmed the storm. He's walking through it with you. Christ is living in you this life. As Paul said, that you live in the flesh, this human existence that we have. We live by faith in the Son of God. We choose to believe that God is here, that Christ has died for me, that I belong to him, that God is doing a work in my life. And even though this is all going on around me, it cannot and will not stop the work that God began in my life. The presence of God in my life. I'm not going to pretend you've never heard this because you've heard it a hundred times. My favorite preacher is Tony Evans. My favorite Tony Evans quote about faith. Faith is acting like something is so even when it's not so in order that it might be so just because God said so. You see, how do we practice God's presence in our life? What does God's presence how does that affect us in those difficult times? 
we choose to believe. Instead of believing what we feel, we choose to believe what we know. We choose to act on what God has said. We choose to, to, to live as though what God has said is true. And even though these circumstances are going on around me, God is doing a work in my life, and he will not stop until he's done. And he ain't done yet, because I'm still here. I won't be done until I get to heaven. I like to define faith this way. That faith is an active trust in all that God has said about himself, his purposes, his precepts, and his promises. Let's think about it. Break that down for just a minute. All that God has said, first of all, about himself, the quality, who God is, that he is good, that he is merciful, that he is present, all the other attributes of God that we find in Scripture, to rehearse those in our mind, to remember who this God is that we call God, to remember who Christ is that is our Redeemer, to remember that He's the Son of God, who the Lamb slain for our sin, that He has risen, seated on the right hand of God, making intercession for us, to, to recognize and remember who the Holy Spirit is. He is the presence of God in our life, empowering us to live the life that God intends for us to live, to, to know what God has said about Himself to know what God has said about his purposes, about his purpose in this world and about his purpose in our life, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That has not stopped because of your circumstances. His precepts, that the way God describes to us to live in his word, this is the right way to live. And, and though we may fail this word, this is the kind of life the Holy Spirit is working in us to try to produce. And as we submit to him and ask him to help us live this kind of life, this is the life that he will bring about, and it will be a life for his glory and for our good and about his promises. What God has said. Let God be true. Let everybody else, let every other situation, let every other circumstance, every other feeling in our life be a liar. Because what God has said is true. Choosing to not base our life on what we feel, but to adjust the thermostat with what we know. I don't know what situation you may find yourself in today, but I do know this. You can trust the promises of a faithful God. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? God, is if, if you are a believer in Christ, if you have surrendered, if you believe in him, if you have repented of your sins and you followed him as your Savior, God has begun a work in you, and that work will not stop. And what may seem to be an obstacle to the work may be the very tool that God is using to refine that work. And we have to choose today. Am I going to believe what I feel? Or am I going to believe what I know? Am I going to rehearse in my mind and constantly think about, oh, this feels so bad. Are we going to dwell on how it feels and let that fill our thoughts and let that motivate our life? Are we constantly going to rehearse in our mind and play the, the recording over and over in our mind of the goodness and greatness, the goodness, mercy, and presence of God? And choose to live in light of that. Or maybe today you don't know Jesus as your Savior. This is what God has offered. Because our life, all, all you know, every one of us live a jacked up life. We're all messed up. And we try to fix it. We try so hard to make it better. We, we drive ourselves crazy trying to turn over a new leaf or just do better. Or better yet, just explain that away. Well, I, I, I've just got to do the best I can. We fail to realize God has graciously taken care of it all on the cross. He invites you today out of his love to say, won't you, won't you follow me? did all of this for you. Romans 8, 28 that we looked at earlier, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his purpose, those who are in the family. You see that Romans 8, 28 is only a family promise. But the good news is he invites you in the family. He wants you in the family. He made it possible through Christ for you to repent of your sins, turn away and say, Jesus, I believe you. I believe you died for me and I surrender to you and I follow you. And those family promises then become your policy. So how's God speaking to you today? What precious promise of God do you most need in your life today? What is that one situation or those two or three situations in your life that God needs to, you needed God to remind you of something good because they feel horrible. Life is not what you feel. Life is what you know, especially who you know when you know him and what you know about him. I call you today to believe God. I call you today to, 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 to revolve your life around what you know to be truth about God and to open his word and read so much more about this great God that we have and as he, he reveals himself to you, to believe that and to trust that and to live by faith in this God that has provided all for you.